And now, okay, now it is around 52% of the available oil that's, that's being consumed. Well, that, in, in fact, of all the oil that's being consumed, 95% has been consumed during my lifetime. Okay, so put it put it that way. In fact, I remember really the time before oil. I remember as a kid in the streets of southeast London, um, playing in the street because there were really essentially no motorized vehicles around. This, this was in London, but uh, in a in a kind of inner suburb, south of the Thames, east of London Thames, um, and we kids used to stone cars that actually <laughs> came along. That's why I got all this stuff. On. <laughs> except, except for the doctor's car. We knew the doctor's car, and we did not stone the doctor's car. Okay? And, and we used to let a few of the commercial vehicles come around, but if any other car came on our street, we would stone it. <laughs> and I remember breaking windshields and, and, um, or windscreens, as we used to call them then, and, and so on. And it was fun. Most, most of the delivery, in fact, all of the delivery, was either horse-drawn or electric. Okay, it was uh, electric, little electric bands or electric floats or the great pain in a horse-drawn car. And if you if you were very nice to the great guy, and I'm not sure exactly what that involved because I never got up there, but I used to envy the guys who got up there. Um, you uh, got to ride with him. So I, I actually remember a time really before oil. I mean, there were, you know, there, there were uh, cars around, um, but the oil consumption when I was about 10 years old was about 5% of what it was, what it is now in, in the UK. Now, it was considerably higher in North America. In North America, in, in 1941, uh, in, sorry, in 1939 in North America, um, there were 75% of all the cars, of all the motorized vehicles and, and cars, <coughs> and, and it was a different world. <coughs> no, of 75% of, of in the world, oh. of, of in the world. Now it's only about 25%, okay, are in North America, but then it was about 75%. North America was already motorized to, to a degree. And one of the most remarkable things about um, North America is that, um, and, and it was, considerably more the case in, in the US than in Canada. Canada, as always, was kind of in between. But in, in the US, in 1941, and they didn't enter the war until right at the end of the year, there were three million automobiles produced, very roughly. And 18 months later, there were none. The, the US switched off. It went from a society uh, whose economy lived on the automobile, and they actually simply closed everything down. They still had automobiles on the road, but gasoline was rationed, and even more importantly, tires were rationed. Um, but there were no new cars being made. And public transit went up by a factor of three, and, uh, and, the, and the world changed. It was a huge, it, it, it is a testimony to how quickly things can happen if there is a, a need for it. Anyway, I just want to make the point that I'm old. In my view, oil, I remember all this stuff, okay, oil, is, oil is the big issue. Um, and I'll come to why, for me, post-carbon means, means oil, rather than the, the other things. Um, we, we, we face an oil problem. What Randy was talking about is because um, we, we, we are bumping up against um, supply limits. And you, you'll be very familiar with this argument, but I think it's interesting to note that um, we are almost exactly recapitulating what happened in 2008. Oil is rising at almost exactly the same rate. It's actually rising higher in Europe because the Brent, as um, somebody said, the Brent price and the, and, and the West Texas price have diverged. They, they were in lockstep for years. And um, in, if you put us back in 2008, in April, um, in the last three, four months, oil had gone up 42% in 2008. It's gone up 30% in North America and 50% in Europe. So it's gone up, you know, and Europe is now the, the, the standard price. It's taken over because there's 
the, the, I, I won't go into it, but there are problems why the North American price is a little bit somewhat lower. Oil is especially the problem in Eastern Canada. Um, Canada and Norway are the only two countries who do not have a strategic petroleum reserve uh, among the rich countries and even the half rich countries, meaning that, uh, for instance, in the US, you never sent me those data on the private uh, stuff, oh. but in, in the US, um, there, there is a, a, a required reserve of oil equivalent to roughly 80 days of imports. And there's also private stores equivalent to roughly the same. Actually, three times as much. Uh, not according to data I see, but I want to talk to you about it. Roughly, there's slightly more, 20% uh, more. So, um, we don't know how much our stores are. I've tried to get this information from the stats can, but we certainly don't have a government reserve. And we import, in eastern Canada, a much higher share of our, our oil. Quebec, in particular, is, is importing 90% of its oil. Uh, Algeria is the largest supplier. Algeria is like third domino down in, in North Africa and the Middle East. And um, as I will talk about later, if you ask me, the um, uh, Quebec government is just beginning to wake up to this. But Ontario is not necessarily better off. Ontario imports only 15% of its oil from elsewhere. 10% comes from Eastern Canada and 75% comes from the West. But every drop of that oil from the West comes through the US. There is no pipeline across Canada. And the US can just turn it off. It's not our pipeline, although some of it's owned by Enbridge. It's actually just the regular pipelines that feed the eastern part of North America, and our oil happens to come through those pipelines. We don't have dedicated pipelines. And even if we did, they could cut it off, but we don't. They're, they're just pipelines. And, and um, we, we're, we're in a very, very vulnerable state, and, and um, Atlantic provinces are hardly better. Uh, uh, Newfoundland produces quite a bit of oil, but it's in long-term commitments to ship south and, and uh, New Brunswick and, and um, the rest of the Maritimes. Overall, Eastern Canada is in a dire situation. We are um, importing, we are getting our oil from abroad or via another country um, to the extent of, no, of almost 90%. And, and that makes us very vulnerable, and we have no reserve except what the oil companies provide for us, and we don't know what, what, what they are. And, we, and, and this really should be addressed. I mean, it, 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 it is an urgent issue. Uh, we, 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 we could not um, uh, function with, with it without some oil. We need to move off oil. Electricity is, in, in my view, um, the alternative, and the way to move off oil uh, to electricity quickly is to le electrify public transit, but not in the way that we're doing it in Toronto. We're spending $8 billion to electrify, to put in a 25 kilometer electrified uh, tunnel um, streetcar line. $8 billion, $400 million per kilometer, very roughly. The Spadina extension is costing $290 million. But there is something much better to do, and, and I gave a talk about this to this group, and that is to do trolley buses. Trolley buses are five million dollars a kilometer. That includes the buses, it includes the um, wires, it includes the substations. Five million. The operating costs are roughly the same uh, at current uh, at gas prices. This means for $8 billion, you can electrify 1,600 kilometers of bus route. 1,600 kilometers. And that would be about 98% of the actual bus travel. There are actually 2,000 kilometers, very roughly, but the remaining 400 don't carry much in the way of buses. I mean, they are bus routes. Currently, half our transit system is electrified. With that, yeah, subways and streetcars, okay? And in terms of trips, in terms of trips, okay? Half is electrified, very, very roughly. So we can electrify, except for a few little bits, essentially the whole of our transit system for the money that is being squandered on the uh, Eglinton um, streetcar line. That's where I think we should go. There is no more effective way of electrifying transit than to electrify 
buses, okay? It's much more effective than electrifying trains, uh, although electrifying trains is good. I mean, God knows where Go um, gets their numbers from on their electrification costs. On um, the major electrification studies in Europe, uh, what they show is that over a 35-year period, electrification pays for itself. But the upfront cost is higher, but you have not only reduced fuel cost, you have reduced maintenance cost because electric trains are lighter. You have more service per kilometer because electric trains are not only faster, more importantly, they accelerate more. So, um, in terms of other carbon, for me, the big issue. Can I ask a question? Sorry, before you go on. Yeah. The five million dollars a kilometer is that is that for is that just for is that for buses on on regular roads or is that on exclusive? Uh, no, that's on regular roads. That's, that's simply to take the diesel routes that we have now. Okay, and and, elect, and and putting trolley buses on. Do you have a price to to uh, exclusive lane? Yeah, uh, that that depends uh, hugely. Uh, it, it could be almost nothing if you just appropriate a lane. <laughs> I, I'm serious. No, it, it could be almost nothing. Um, you know, uh, like literally a couple of thousand bucks per kilometer. I mean, just just that, just the code. Yeah, yeah okay. zero. But um, if you're putting in a new lane. Putting in a new lane, if you don't have line costs, is about $2 million a kilometer. Okay, putting in a new lane, okay? And that's one lane. Uh, the, the $5 million was a two-way cost. One lane is roughly $2 million. This is a lane that is probably, uh, with a proper foundation and grade, you know, can carry buses, okay? But, I mean, you don't have to do it. I mean, the buses are running perfectly well now. You know, you, it's not. Well, on some yeah. roads, but not on. Right? Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. But that's not the issue. The issue is not to make the buses run better. Well, they will run better if they're electric because they they will accelerate faster. But uh, not at the road spot, though, right? So that's the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the advantage of the of the. the oh no! Road no yeah, 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 yeah. The advantage of the plane. Yeah, but yeah, it's only condition of electrification. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm just. I, 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 I know your point. In terms of other carbon issues, uh, um, I mean, I've had this argument often with Jeff individually and with post-carbon generally. Um, I think the whole um, uh, climate change, carbon in the air thing is a digression. There are serious issues around the other carbon. Um, there, there are local pollution issues. I mean, it is almost worth electrifying diesel buses just to get them off the road. I mean, there's a stronger reason for doing it. But the local, the local um, uh, pollution has become pushed out of the way by, by this preoccupation with, with climate, which I think has been a big red herring, uh, like fuel cells and, and like natural gases that come in. There's another issue, and that is the exhaustibility of, of carbon supplies. And um, it's not an immediate issue, but it's, it's an issue. I, I don't think climate change is an issue, and we, we can discuss that. So um, th those are um, basically the points where, where I'm coming from. In terms of the election, um, my history is, when I was a councillor, I was a member of the NDP and, and ran, um, I, I was elected six times and my NDP presence or, or appearance was stronger at some times than, than at others. Um, but. Um, at, at least in the early days, we had an NDP caucus. I, I became um, really quite disenchanted with the NDP during the Barbary government, um, and I can go into that exactly why. Not that, uh, anyway, I can go, go into that. It's not entirely relevant now. In terms of this election, I am um, supporting the NDP, although I am a member of the Green Party, of the provincial Green Party. I'm not a member of the Federal Green Party, and the part of this is to do with Jack Layton. Um, Jack Layton and I go back a long way. He, he was the first fundraiser. He was in my first election campaign. He was my fundraiser. His then wife was my office manager. Uh, we sat next to each other on city council for ages, and we just go back a long way. He followed me into being president of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, and we, you know, we, 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 and, and I'm an admirer of his, and um, so uh, 
I have quite a few problems with federal MVP um, policy, but um, policies uh, on the matters that we're talking about, I mean, this idea of, of taking a tax on heating oil, or fuels, for example, is, is for the birds, and the cap and trade, in my view, is for the birds. But um, I, I think um, uh, Jack is a person to be supported, and I live in Libya's ward, and I think Jack would be better if Olivia's in Ottawa, so we have an Olivia Chow sign on our on our lawn, and I and I give them money, and I'm I'm very uh, pleased as to what they're doing. Why is it happening? Well, um, in Quebec um, is is where it seems to appear to start and be the strongest. Um, I, I was last in Quebec for a substantial period a couple of weeks ago and I could see the beginning of this. What I, what I saw mostly was the demise of the Liberals in, in Quebec, um, rather than the, 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 the ascendance of the NDP. But you could see that as well, um, where, where, for example, the NDP candidate, I can't remember her name, had a stronger presence in Justin Trudeau's writing than Justin Trudeau does. And, and, um, I, I don't know how that's playing out now, but um, Jack uh, was taking hold, and this was before his uh, superb performance in the um, in the, um, uh, the the leaders French leaders debate, and also before people kind of woke up to the election in a big way and, and began to feel a bit tired with the um, uh, Seth and and, and so on, and, and Jack, I mean, what Jack has brought to this campaign, and he's had it before, but it's been very evident, and it's been more evident in Quebec, but it's also evident uh, very much in English Canada. He is a cheerful, optimistic, agreeable person, whereas these other leaders, the three of them, not Elizabeth May so much, but the, the, the Harper is a selfless, and, and um, Ignatia is a selfless, and Doucette has become a selfless, so I don't think he's kind of naturally a selfless, I think the other two somewhat are. Whereas Jack glows, you know, and in Quebec they pick this up very much. I mean, they, uh, they, 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 they're, Quebec is floundering around. They're, they're, Andrew Coyne on, on the CBC last night said a very good thing, which I think is absolutely true about Quebec. They, um, they, they want to be somewhere else, but they don't want to make a decision about it. And, and Jack is 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 a perfect boat to um, uh, to go with. And and he's he's had some luck. I mean, there's a nice expression in, in Quebec, and bon Jack, and uh, you know, good guy. And and somehow that's caught on, you know. The, and and so uh, and then in, in the rest of the country, I mean, what is happening? I think is that people. Um, uh, except for quite a substantial hardcore, um, people are just pissed off with the way things have been going, and, and um, pissed off with Harper, pissed off with his all of his uh, many of his senses, and, and um, Ignatieff is, is just no kind of appeal at all. I remember when I first came to Canada uh, in, in 1968. One of the stars of this country was Ignatius father, and um, the uh, who, who was the Canadian ambassador to the United Nations, and, and the Czech um, uh, if uprising was happening then, and, and uh, the older Ignatius was a star. I mean, he was part of the reason I stayed. I came to Canada for two years. And part of the reason I stayed was having wonderful people like Ignatius father around, and then. When I was a, a councillor, one of my constituents was Michael Ignatius's brother, uh, uh, who, who, who they are now, but it was then not on speaking terms, and I may have got a bit prejudiced against um, uh, Mr. Ignatius, but he, he, um, he, he, he is not like his father and he is not like his brother. He, he's, he, he is like some of the unkind things that people say about him, although uh, in public, in, in private, I don't know him, I've never met him. But he's certainly not turning people on. But he, 
Jack has done a very skillful thing. He has, in English Canada, he, uh, and to a different way in French Canada, he has um, he has lumped Ignatiev in with Harper. And and people are pissed off with Harper and don't see Ignatiev as an alternative and, and, and well we'll see. I don't know how how it's how it's gonna shake down. My my own as I mentioned earlier to Jeff, my own view is that I think there will be a, a liberal, uh, conservative liberal coalition uh, after this election. I think the NP is going to come second, and the two natural governing parties will, will keep them keep, keep them out. Formal coalition, or I don't. I'm not sure. I yeah, yeah, yeah. I I mean yeah my vote yeah yeah. Uh, it, it it will have to be more than. I think this time it can't be a conservative plurality that that, that just goes back. I, I think if the NDP is second, I think it has depends a little bit on votes, but I think it has to uh, has to be some kind of statement by the leader of the Liberal Party, if it's still in that yet, that um, the Liberals will, uh, for the time being, support the Conservatives as the government. Because I don't see Jack doing that by coming in second. Um, because that's what happened. That's, that's what the liberals did last time. I mean, the NDP, when they had so few people, were able to say, we're just always going to vote against the government. Yeah. And they got, in, in a sense, a free ride by being able to do that. Because they can go back now and say, oh, we always opposed Harper, whereas the liberals supported Harper. Yeah. But if the tables are turned and the NDP comes second, well, the liberals could do that, that same thing now. Oh, and say, we're all the votes. Depends, depends, depends on the votes. And also depends on, on, on the block. I mean, the block is going to have at least 30 seats and, and probably more. And, and they, they will still be a, a factor in, in, in all of this, especially if the other numbers are close. Do you think there will be any chance of winning? I honestly don't know. I mean, it would, be, <laughs> it would be an interesting thing. I think they have no chance of being a majority government. Okay. I think they have possibly. If, you know, I mean, possibly a slight chance of having a plurality, but I think probably not. Uh, I mean, the, uh, the Tories are, are pretty entrenched above that 30% line that gives them the, you know, but there's still a few days left. Um, so I mentioned some of my concerns about the NDP. Um, and and I, I will hold my nose about this in, in um, my, my current support. But you know, if Jack does get into whatever position of power, and even if he doesn't, I, he's going to be a more important figure. And I, I will be on his tail about some of these issues quite soon. And, and some of it will be shaped by this evening. You may not like um, how, how I'm progressing, but um, here, but. I mean, we, we have to start seriously conserving oil. I mean, it is not, it, 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 it is not, uh, and, and the, 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 the way to conserve oil is simply, <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but use less of it in the short term and, and, and um, have systems that use less of it in the long term, and the system that uses less of it is smaller cars. We're already seeing some of that, but it's gotta be, it's gotta be done with, in, in, a, in a much more aggressive way, and it's gotta be done in a way that for Ontario protects our biggest manufacturing resource and, and all of these things are, are possible. It needs more nudges by government. I mean, the, what, what the Harper government, government and the McGinty government did was, in my view, ridiculous. And that is keeping General Motors alive with no conditions. I mean, that, that was absolutely absurd. I, I didn't have a problem with them keeping it alive, but the idea of no conditions and now Ford is coming up there that was not kept alive and is much more attuned to the market and is actually making money out of producing smaller cars in a way that General Motors, uh, and, I mean, right price for all, but General Motors is not. And, and uh, it just shows what, could have conditions, what conditions could have been applied. And then um, uh, we've got to get more serious about electrification. I mentioned the particular Toronto situation, but there are, there are many other aspects of this. Uh, and in Quebec, I think it, it's a bit early to say, but I think this is beginning to happen seriously. And of course, Quebec is in a very good position to do this. It has a roughly 20% surplus already of electricity that it exports, mainly to the US. Um, it, it, um, 
it has a huge amount of electricity that uh, could be conserved. Uh, I mean, I don't know the exact number, but half the homes in, in Quebec are A, in a very cold place, B, electrically heated, and C, badly insulated. You know, there's just a, a huge thing. I mean, electricity, if, if there's a place in the world where electricity began to approach being too cheap to meter, it's, it's Quebec. And they're just waking up to, to, to um, the, the broader value of this resource. And, and they have, although you know, there are environmental and other problems to do with this, they, they have the possibility of basically doubling their supply. Uh, and and you know, the, 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 um, um, I don't think they need to do it, but I'm just saying if they, if, if they, they can change it. Which would, which would be how much? I can't remember the number. So you used to find out. So we talking about more large scale hydro? Yes. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Just because um, I mean, there is a climate impact to the. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, yeah. I'm not arguing for this. I'm just saying, you know, yeah. if the if, 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 if they if they were to need that security. Hmm. Um, is that through conservation or through expanding building uh, more than? Well, what I'm saying is they've got a huge amount of room through conservation that they could exploit. But they could double their supply in terms of hydroelectric. I mean, they're, 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 they have the, the capacity to do that. So if you add conservation, you back to increasing production. Yeah, huge amounts. Absolutely, as I say, I mean, it's... it's so it's, that would be the electric tar sands? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, somebody has already used that for it. Oh, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, one of the things I think we need in Canada, uh, and it's the, it should be the project for the 21st century, is a national grid. We need it in the east to take advantage not only of Quebec, but also of the even bigger resources in Labrador that, that we, we might want to use. Um, plus, not to mention the tidal stuff but in, in the Bay of Sunday and, and, and other things. And, and the marine current stuff in in, um, in St. Lawrence and off the Atlantic coast. But we need it equally in the West. The West is a bizarre place electrically, and I've done a little work there. We have two provinces that are essentially as self-sufficient uh, as, as Quebec, BC and Manitoba. Manitoba actually exports just about the same share, like a sixth of its power. But it's all south. Uh, BC is pr produces essentially 100% hydro, but doesn't you know it, it, that's what it does. But Saskatchewan and Alberta are basically coal fired, and all the lines are north south. They're not east west. All the so there's almost no not quite no but there's almost no electricity going across provincial boundaries in the west. There's almost none going between Manitoba and Ontario. In fact, there's very little going between Ontario and Quebec. What we need is a national grid that would be for Canada, linking Canada, binding Canada in the 21st century, like the railway lines did in the 19th century. But are these $3 million a kilometer? Mm -hmm. Are these the $3 million a kilometer lines? What? The, the transmission lines. The, the the transmission lines. Yeah, I'm not sure what what they cost actually. The the um, uh, the there are very wide numbers and a range of numbers for for this. The, the people who are really at the top of the technology. I mean, there's a technological aspect here, and that is you know, PC, the voltage DC or AC how. But the, the one thing where the Chinese are absolutely ahead of anybody else is in electrical transmission. And I think that they, they, they have the highest voltage lines, they have the most efficient lines in terms of um, and the, the loss, yeah, capacity, and so on, and also the lowest cost. And, and I heard a figure, although I won't vouch for it, of less than a million dollars. In, now that's in China, which may not be something you can translate directly. So we're not dealing necessarily with 
big amounts of money. But what, what a Canadian, I don't have a North American value for, for, for that. Interestingly enough, it would be a lot more. It would be a lot more. Because, of course, that's zero cost to expropriate. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, yeah. and, and zero cost for environmental studies and yeah. lift stuff and so on. I mean, you basically can't. One of the interesting things that's going on in Germany, and, and you've inspired me to look at it more carefully with that, is, is they are completely reshaping their electrical system. And one of the problems with reshaping your electrical system and getting out of nuclear, getting into more wind, more solar, blah, blah, blah. And one of the problems is you have to reshape your distribution system. And, and one of the things they found is that they have a distribution system which they're not using very effectively, which is their electrified train lines. Um, and they're not, they, they've seen it as a kind of separate thing, and they've just woken up to the fact that, that, that these lines, and often even the actual lines themselves, the actual overhead wires, can serve um, dual purposes. And I, I know that's going on. I'm going to look into it more. And actually, I don't know what the, the, the cost is. I know they've worked on to that. And, and, and David is right. The, the, expert, the land costs are, are, are potentially large. Well, they're, they're just they're so small in China when you just say, we're, we're arriving, move, you can 10 minutes go. You know? Yeah. Last couple of points. Um, we, 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 we need a strategic petroleum reserve in Eastern Canada. We don't need one in Western Canada. They, 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 we, we're, we're too, I mean, there are pipelines going from Alberta and Saskatchewan to Manitoba and to BC, and they're all linked. They're not linked electri electrically, they're linked with pipelines. We have a gas line, natural gas line, that goes north of, uh, of Lake Superior, which is entirely in Canada. And, and we use a lot of ga natural gas in the east, and almost all of it comes from, from the west. A little bit comes from. And that means it's a political decision. Yes. Yeah. We need, um, at, at a minimum, a strategic petroleum reserve. And there is possibly, although I think it needs to be researched, a case for an oil pipeline uh, between the West and, and, and the East. Possibly. I, but at, at a minimum, we need a strategic petroleum reserve. We need to use a lot more electricity, but we also need to conserve it more. And, and um, uh, these are all things that a federal government could be doing. It, it could be, above all, in a broad way, turning its attention to energy, particularly oil and electricity, and turning its attention away from less relevant things like carbon emissions and, and, and so on. And um, just as preoccupation with climate change has got in the way of local pollution, it's also got in the way of understanding our oil and energy predicament generally. My view is that even if we have to make electricity from coal, which I would not advocate, it is better than burning oil if we're using the electricity for transportation. But um, the, the oil issue is a more important one, and in any case, there, there are fewer local emissions which are uh, continue to be an underrated issue. I, I, I said longer than I want, but um, I, I'd be interested in, in responses to all of this and just having a discussion with my talking about Question, first of all. Uh, so you talked about trolley buses. Um, why aren't the trolley bus companies out there selling? I mean, I'm in Vancouver. They have a lot of trolley buses. They, yeah. I grew up in Vancouver, because so they've had trolley buses for a long time. But the new ones are very nice. Why doesn't the trolley bus company coming to park one in the middle of Yonge Street and say, look how big this is? Well, it's an interesting question. I mean, Vancouver has just renewed its 30-year-old trolley bus fleet. I mean, renewed in the last four or five years. It's got 264 wonderful trolley buses, which you've seen. Um, about a third of them are articulated, two-thirds are single cab. Um, they can drive off-wire for about 700 meters. Um, if they have a, a problem, um, there you, you you it used to be the case you're in Vancouver and some corners you know poles would come off every time you just you don't see that anymore. They they they, 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 they seem to fix that technology. The, the poles stay on the wires. The drivers love them. The operators love them, and they are made in Canada. Every single one of those trolley buses. The drivetrain is made in Germany. 
but and are, are exported to um, new fire industries uh, in the suburb of Winnipeg, and they may, they, would, they were all made there. But the um, the I forget the guy's name, but the agent of the German company, which has an unpronounceable name, um, that. Uh, um, was really the, the driver. The, the German company, I mean, it was the, it was the um, new fire industries that put it, the, you know, built buses, but it was the German company that was driving it, that was dealing with um, Vancouver just as much as anything else. And it's, and, 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 you know, the, the German company provides the core of the bus. They've actually been drawn from Canada. They, they, um, they have just been discouraged. They were very discouraged by what happened in Edmonton a couple of years ago where, when a decision was made to um, cancel their trolley bus fleet. And, um, you know, Hamilton had trolley buses until 1993. We had them until 1992. Um, it was a truly dumb decision. Truly, truly dumb decision. And um, uh, we're living with it. And the German company came up just because there's other markets they can go to. Their absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Oslo Coal. And um, yep, people are switching to trolley buses. They are a, um, I say, rel they're relatively low cost. I mean, they cost more than diesel buses, but you know, I can give you some sources um, where there have been direct comparisons and. Um, uh, they, they, they compare favorably, especially if you, I mean, just on a straight, forget about the oil conservation or the oil issue. Um, a place called Solingen in, in, Solingen in Germany um, uh, did a very nice comparison in, of, of uh, trolley buses and, and, and found that um, uh, if, if, the, if they, they had the trolley buses with um, um, uh, what do you call it? Where you capture the energy from the brake regenerative brake regenerative braking. Um, they they're actually slightly cheaper than um, uh, diesel buses. Uh, I think it was ninety six percent. And if you didn't have the regenerative braking, they were slightly more expensive, one hundred and four percent. The the total cost over. Oh, that's that's life cycle cost. Yeah, life cycle cost. Not. Yeah. Cost. Yeah. Life cycle. Because I find hard to believe the capital cost of, a, of an electric bus is more than the diesel bus. I'm, I'm intrigued with that. Well, the reason the bus is more expensive is economies of scale. Mm -hmm. In in in, in yes. is there are zillions of diesel buses made in the I mean, in, you know, a, an electric trolley bus has 38 moving parts and a diesel bus has several thousand. And, and well, electric motors are cheaper than that's electric right. combustion motors. I mean, that's right. Dollars too but much. it's economies of scale. Oh, okay. And, yeah. and okay. you know, if you, if you were able to manufacture trolley buses to the, uh, in the numbers, uh, they would be cheaper. Yeah. At least part of this event was supposed to be about the fact that we're going to the polls on May 2nd. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and we here at Post Carbon 12 were created because we believe that at the leadership level, in terms of the people that are supposed to be the most concerned with our welfare, that they are not addressing the issues that seem to us as plain as the writing on that piece of paper. Right? No more difficult to understand than the writing on that piece of paper. That clear, that easy to understand. Now you've had the chance, you know, to go back a long way, Jack Lake. You've had the chance, you know, for 15 <coughs> years to to be in government here in Toronto. You've had the chance to work with government people in Hamilton and in the <coughs> and all around the world, right? What seems so obvious to us is that our national interests, our security, <coughs> our economic well-being, our prosperity, our affluence, our culture mm -hmm. is being betrayed because <coughs> those things that you talk about in terms of being dire are not being addressed. And in this current election, mm -hmm. they're essentially invisible. So why is it? Do they know like we know? Do they not know? <coughs> why is it invisible? Well, I mean, politicians are 
in, in, in our kind of society are, are um, uh, sitting there at the center of the whole bunch of pressures. And the pressures are, are very strong. The pressures from the automotive industry, the pressures from the um, energy industries, the pressures from people. And and uh, the status quo is is powerful. The the the, the, the question is um, the risk of breaking out of the status quo. And um, sometimes things can happen. And and you know if Jack does get into a position of power one way or the other. Um, we will be at a breaking point that may be useful, especially if gas prices in the next few weeks um, uh, start rising uh, again. I, mean, I think they kind of stole around $1.30, right? We're going up for a while. We're going up for a long weekend. No, in May, we're going up for a long weekend. Yeah. yeah. So, um, it's... Do they know is the question? Do they know? Do they know? Are they aware in the same way that the people that come to this room are aware? Well, they don't have the luxury of being aware in the way that we are aware. Because they, 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 they... Well, they can read books. They can read the same Well, they, they can read the same data. data. They don't have time to read books. Well, <coughs> they, read books. well they can <coughs> get them and read books and then brief them. Yeah, but they have that luxury. Right? Yeah, but it's not a question of briefing. It's a question of 10 to 20% what doing what you think is right and 80 to 90 percent doing what you think is possible well i'm okay with that but i just this is a different question yeah do they know are they aware of the risks that they are putting the canadian, the, on the, the, I, canadian your, your question is a good one the, the the answer is uh, dimly some of them yes but basically no i mean uh, they, they will have the same politicians are very much people and uh, if you want to know what a politician thinks go and talk to <coughs> a few people in the street and that's what a politician thinks the difference is to a degree what they can <coughs> about. and and you know the, there is a chance of politicians shaping I mean what happens but they're not really big shapers my, my position is better you know, voters want it. The, the, the reason the reason the politicians don't move on on peak oil is because the voters don't care. That's right. And that's I think what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's I mean the, the problem isn't convincing about politicians, it's convincing the voters. The voters if the politicians believe the voters want it, they will yeah. offer it to us. Yeah, there's I a think, term that it does come up but, with uh, voterists. And as in motorists, but they're motorists. So we tend to live in a fairly corrupt society, I think, and uh, you know, corrupt in North America, yeah, for sure. So uh, it's very frustrating. But Richard, I do have an issue with how you are emphasizing the oil issues over climate change. For me, uh, I'm happy that the oil is running out, but climate change and all the gases we put in, for me, that's the really big one. That's the big nasty. I, I, it is not a sideshow. I, I, it is the main. Change. I don't want to disturb you on this, but I think that position is basically a theological position rather than a scientific one. Oh, well, I, I, and we, we could we could we could well, have the money, as Jim Paul has pointed out, pretty extensive database. It's about 97, 98 percent of scientific opinion. So you're the one in 50 that of peer-reviewed science. I mean, I know there's whole journals, and I and I, I like those articles. And, and, and I, I like the articles by by job, and I, I read them now. Reading the journal that, that they're getting published in, and seeing the ones coming out in Nature as well. Um, so I don't think there's any trouble with. I don't see them as much in opposition. Um, and if anything, I'm, I would actually qualify how they're dark publication of what Hamish was pointing this up. Um, saying that it's good that it's oil running out, and in fact, we need carbon to save carbon. Yeah, so yeah, so the idea great. that, yeah. I mean, there's, all, there's false ideas on both sides. I think it's a false idea that 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 running out of oil is is any insurance, given given the inertia in the system now, that that's a, a viable insurance policy. I mean, and I, and I actually believe most of the, of the thesis of what the, 
prominent pe people in the deep oil movement are positing, which is really not the mainstream IPCC, um, how they see it. But I still see there's all sorts of things that David Rutledge doesn't. If you look at his Excel spreadsheets, he stops at, at anthropogenic sources. He doesn't have anything about carbon. There's nothing about the rest of natural science. In, in, in this analysis of uh, depletion of fossil fuels, there's absolutely nothing about methane clap rates, about, um, about carbon cycles, about all the other factors that we're now seeing happening of changing. I, I think we have to look at what's offsetting climate change. Right now, we have a fleet of airliners that flies over the continent every day. It creates, you know, using jet vapor trails, artificial clouds. And those clouds are actually reducing the amount of sunlight hitting the continent. Therefore, they're reducing the amount of global warming on the continent. You can, you can look at the information after 9-11, what happened when uh, you get research yeah. looking at the, the temperature rise. And they saw temperature rise over North America by one degree. My concern is, what happens when we can't afford to fly those planes? What happens when the amount of people flying over North America increases and get a half degree increase over the span of 10 years? That, to me, is really scary. Because that will you know, kick in other things in terms of climate change. Could, could I just make, make my position clear? My, my position is relatively neutral about whether these things are happening. I, I don't think the scientific evidence supports the strong position. Well, that's one thing. But, but yeah. well, no, no. We're just, uh, you're, 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 there's a whole spectrum of positions here. My position is that there are more important issues, which is not to say that this is not an issue that should be considered. And the two more important issues, I think, are the, the fact that we are floating, our civilization floats on a sea of oil, which is which is going to begin to disappear. We should do something about it or else we'll have serious problems in our society. And secondly, we have a local pollution issue which has been pushed right out of the way by, by um, climate change concerns. And the lo local pollution issue is here and real. And, and the climate change is, if, if it happens, it's, it's sure. somewhere else in there. Sure, I don't think so. Most of the groups like the Ontario Clean Air you know, Coalition, the environmentalists have been on those same themes for decades. It was the same people who've been working on those things. So, so to say that, well, climate change is this big, bad, big, bad um, distraction that's coming in and, and pushing, well, no, they're pushing out the legitimate environmental concerns of local pollution, that it, that's a straw man argument. I don't, I, don't, I don't think Richard quite said that. And, and I think uh, maybe one of the pieces of, of Richard's point is that the public can only get, is, is only interested in one issue at a time. And uh, right now, the issue that, that has been dominant is climate change. I'm not concerned about climate change. Well, uh, and, and because, because that is the big issue, and because it's a big picture, long-term issue, then uh, the average citizen goes, okay, well, uh, you know, don't need to worry about that. Well, okay. they don't, they don't think they should. No, we're all, we're all, we're all, we're all have multiple identities, and we're all, to a fair degree, economic creatures ourselves. I mean, and so the more I read about peak oil, it's quite easy for me to start to forget about climate change, and then I start to foreground in my own mind, worrying about economics, oil, will I be able to you know, buy fuel 10 years from now and heat my house? And I can quite easily, even myself, start to forget about climate change. But when you look at Andrew Nick Fork's site, one of the abstracts from one of his papers just points out that it'll be very, very easy. As, as peak oil kicks in, because people can see the direct economic impact of peak oil happening to them, it'll be just so easy to say, okay, fine, let's, let, let's forget about climate change. And then you spend all your political capital fighting peak oil, which is a a totally legitimate thing to fight on, but if you forget about climate change at the same time and start to run your electricity on, on coal and say, oh well, this carbon doesn't really matter, you know, let the coral, you know, let the coral acidify, you know, let, let the oceans die, whatever, let, let the forest fires get all the extra radiation that we're getting now. Like we had double the rate of forest fire burn this last year, three million hectares burned, which is double the last average over the last ten years. If you start to see, like just because Moscow has a boreal forest right beside it, but Ottawa is hundreds of kilometers in the boreal forest, you know, we're not, we may not get the impact in Canada of that, 
but, but it'll literally take the forest burning beside the Capitol before people start to see, oh, you know, maybe it is for you. And, and, and then, you know, just just because Canadians will deal with climate change doesn't mean anyone else will deal with climate change. And, it, and it's human nature to want a better life while at the same time, you know, not really caring about nature. You know, who cares about the world? Who cares about nature? We want a better life today. And that's that's the view that the majority of people in the world have. You're not going to change human nature. And that's, that's we well, spend so much time. I want that the Europeans are actually taking climate change fairly seriously. Can't, Canadians aren't. And then even with some, some U.S. Yeah, uh, I want to interject here for a second. It, this is a very wide-ranging discussion, and it's easy to get into talking about what is the nature of human nature, in which we will you know, spend an endless amount of time and that you not very much. This is a Canada votes. I said Canada votes today. Thank you, right? Thank you. Within the Canadian construct, during this election, I think we have seen essentially no attention paid to climate change. Or peak oil. Or peak oil. There's been a bit more of a climate change. But hang on. 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 But hang what is impacting on the Canadian's conscience. Yeah. Because when we have an election, it's one of the few times in the four-year cycle where the media does its job in terms of bringing up issues to people and hitting them over the head with them constantly so that there's some impact on their consciousness. So our perceptions are shaped to a certain extent you know, during elections, to a greater extent during elections than any other time in the four-year cycle. So. During this particular election, we have seen an enormous focus on the economy. Right? It's all about the economy. It's the economy stupid. Right? And very little about the issues that concern us. Right? Now that's why I asked you that question. Do they know? Can I, can I make <coughs> one uh, Ken Dryden wrote a book, um, Becoming Ken Editor or something, something like that. Um, really interesting book. And he mentions energy issues. And the key thing that his his idea is we need to have a bigger vision for Canada. That's what he wants. The thing we need to do now is not this petty stuff. But we need to have the next big vision for what's, what what do we want Canada to be? And he talks about energy issues. So I think he knows at least more than the average person uh, about the limitations of it. So I, I think a, a number of politicians do know. Certainly, Jean did, yeah. but look where it got, Stephen Jean, right? Well, we, I mean, the, 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 Jean was a case in point about um, crowding out the, the, um, the oil supply issue, even for Quebec, with, with, with um, climate change, where um, his his position was that you know the, what we need to do is focus on climate change, and the oil issue will work itself out. Um, and I, I think that, that's a matter of faith. I mean, the interesting thing about the economy is that the economy is intimately tied. As we as we learned three years ago, the economy, even more than the people in the interested in the whole peak oil thing, imagine the economy. I mean, they'd always you know paid lip service the idea that economy and the oil price were tightly intertwined, but nobody quite realized how much it they were until three years ago. And yet Canada has a very anomalous position in all this, because in July 2008, Canada was hauling in money, as it is now, hand over fist, um, because it is a major exporter of oil. And, and that just percolates through, through the economy. And then, of course, by December, it went down even below 36. It went down um, to uh, whatever. And, and um, uh, people were getting desperate in, in, in Alberta. I mean, it, is, it is, uh, was a huge difference to that. Fortunately, Alberta depends a lot on natural gas, and the same thing didn't happen at the same time with that. Sure, they're getting desperate after the crash in 
Hmm? They were getting desperate after the crunch. Yes. So, yeah. 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 How do we grow our economy while using less energy? Or, I mean, you know, Jeff Rubin talks about that. You know, he says we, we can grow our economy, but no one's really made a convincing argument on that. Like, what, what do you think about that? Well, um, it depends exactly what you're doing. But you know, in in uh, around about 1980, maybe a little bit earlier, the Jap Japanese um, government got all their big businesses together and said, you know. We, we, we really want to do something about the way in which we use energy. And because uh, they import every single drop of oil that, that, that they use. And, you know, they made some good decisions and they made some bad decisions. I mean, part of their nuclear dependence came out of that. But um, uh, it, it is also the case that their energy use per GDP is about 40% of the US. And so, uh, and that was a direct result of a national. Um, program to do that. And they might even be able to get that down even further if they worked out it more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how do you, uh, electric, electric transport versus car manufacturers, how do which unions are involved in the manufacturer's vote? Have you done calculations on jobs lost from one person's gain and another? No. Yeah. Presentation? Yeah. 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 I mean, the, the automotive industries are potentially very versatile. And I mentioned at the beginning what happened in the Second World War in the US, where they were literally hauling the, um, the machinery out of, out of automobile factories, um, hauling the assembly lines out of automobile factories, or the things that go around the assembly lines, and putting them in to make tanks and guns and planes and, and, and so on. And, and hardly with any pause, the same workers were were um, employed making other stuff, and and it, you know it, it it would be relatively easy. But the in, in terms of the, I mean, there is no automotive industry we're talking about that is electrified. Can we make a and, and you've got to you've got to also make a distinction here between between automobiles that have batteries that um, are probably an, another dead end. I mean, there's always going to be use for batteries. But batteries are really problematic. And what I was talking about, which is electrified buses, that are getting their power without without batteries, or for the most part without batteries. Would Sorry. There, would there be a, a union meeting where such a presentation would be uh, interesting, interesting, instead of just preaching to the choir of your Yeah. I think the thing, well, I think what, what um, if you're replacing uh, personal vehicles with mass transit, that's a significant decrease in capital and hardware and therefore employment. So I think you have a hard sell to automotive workers who are making personal automobiles, Hondas and Toyotas and, and Fords, to convince them to, that there's a good idea to move to a mass transit based transportation that, system. That would be a plus for your private car one, even though it seems so fanciful, but it actually would be a big plus for industry to, mm -hmm. to, to scale it down to like each street in the electrified. You see, what, what we're yeah. seeing in, in the automotive industry now is, is a, a desperate move to keep the status quo exactly as right. they um, as described, because we, we have a an industrial society, particularly in North America, but also elsewhere, that depends upon every family having one or every household having one or two of these hugely expensive um, uh, bits of equipment. And and what we've seen is, first of all, which is fading now, a preoccupation with fuel cells as being the way to keep the thing going without without oil. Fuel cells don't work. Now it's shifted over to batteries. And there's going to be probably not quite to the degree of fuel cells. There's going to be the same disappointment. I mean, batteries are, are um, I mean, if you look ahead 50 years and we look back, batteries are probably going to be, um, the battery vehicle is going to be a bit of a niche vehicle. The, the, and bicycles. 
Yeah. Those yeah. Guys are, here we go. Uh, the automotive industry, people, some, you know, if you, don't, if you haven't thought about it, it's hard to appreciate how significant a big industry it is. Absolutely. The average autom an average automobile assembly line runs 50 vehicles an hour on average, right? So every hour you're manufacturing 50 vehicles to off the end. Say each of those vehicles is worth retail 25,000 for nice round numbers. So, I don't know, do the math. How many dollars per hour is this plant making? And the plant runs, well, the plants are probably running, easily running at least two shifts, if not three. So 80 hours a week times 50 weeks. It's billions and billions of dollars coming out of one manufacturing plant. Most of those cars are being bought on credit, so you've got the increase in the credit supply. Absolutely. Well, no, 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 no. But I mean, the point is, it's just it's a huge amount of money, an automotive industry, it's just a huge amount of money coursing through the economy. For, I mean, for good or bad, but it's just, you know, it's so one, one, one of the, all that one, one of the, is, 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 a, is terrifying in some ways, right? One of the few things that people are just realizing in the U.S. is that, I mean, the, what happened to the housing market in the U.S. was very important, but it was, and, and it, it impacted a lot of people and its ramifications are still going on. But there was something that was just about as big, although it happened a bit later, um, and, and it happened mostly in 2008 and 2009, and that is there was this retraction in the automobile industry. For almost every year for the decade before 2008, the U.S. industry was producing 16 or 17 million cars a year. And then it went down to nine, and it's only gone up back to 11. And it seems to be stalling at around 11 or maybe maybe 12. And for the reasons that they debate, this is a huge factor in the US economy. It's the major reason why they have this unemployment problem. It's not, it's not just the people in the, in, the, um, in the plants. It's all the other stuff, you know, even the loans and the and the selling and the fixing the fuel and, and, and you know there's oil there's, yeah it's even fewer cars Tires. on the roads uh, and and it's it's something of a sea change and um, I mean General Motors has and, and Toyota although Toyota has not really kinds of problems have both issued statements and say that they think that this is permanent that this that the, 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 the Automotive industry is now 30% below what it what it was before 2008, and will always be. Well, for the for the foreseeable. And, and you're making me think of a statistic I remember that you know last year or the year before there were more bicycles manufactured than cars in the global. I think that's always true. Uh, no, no, <laughs> but I mean, you know. Well, this brings up an important. It should be. <laughs> it brings up an important point in terms of the election. Right. We don't. See leadership in terms of the issues that we care about. Oh, this is the You know, the right. of this right? Well, yeah, but that doesn't translate the impact, right? So I'm talking about shaping perception. I'm talking about actually winning, actually changing things. You know, Elizabeth May having the right attitudes doesn't actually make us win. Right? It doesn't actually make us win, right? And I'm talking about the change or society, right? right? So what we've seen in the last 30 years are two major trends inside the North American economy, right, and society. One is the rise of financialization. Right? So the rise of financialization took, in the 1970s, we, once upon a time, about 5% of all capital investitures was involved in speculation. Right? From the 1970s to today, that is completely flipped around, where today, 95% of capital is involved in speculation, 5% is involved in productive, you know, investing in productive activities. So where do you get that? That is, that that is true. absolutely 100% true. Anyway, the second thing that's arisen out of that is the fact that in the 1970s, the early 1970s, Wall Street made up 3% of corporate profits at the height before the credit default swaps and collateralized loan obligations, construction investment and vehicles blew up. The Wall Street made up over 40% of corporate profits in the United States of America. And so we've seen the rise of a completely artificial parasite become a dominant player within the economy. At the very same time, we've seen the the rise of the idea of an automatic self-correcting system, right? The Frederick Hayek idea, 
you know, from the Austrian School of Economics, where the politicians, you know, starting with Thatcher and Reagan, are supposed to take their hands off the wheel. And if they simply get government out of the way, then it will be a self-correcting system which will allocate resources in the most perfect manner possible for human systems to do. Now, your point about money going through the system, you know, so much money, so much inertia, so much difficulty in order to change that, is that the market can't signal what we want to signal in order to allow us to avoid, you know, running into major problems. Simultaneously, our leaders, obviously, can't believe they've taken their hands off the wheel. So it seems to me obvious that the heavy lifting is going to have to be done by circumstances. Right? It's going to have to be in the same way that the Second World War, it was circumstances that caused this massive turn. Right? It wasn't, you know, people talking, it was things happening. But, and then we saw a major turnaround. So it's going to be again, because of the you know the rise of financialization and because the, our politicians have bought into this automatic you know, self-correcting system. There is no not going to be leadership, so it's going to have to be a crisis. Now, in a crisis, to what degree do you think Canada has the ability to recreate that moment in time when we had Cartier, we had, you know, um, McDonald, and we created the rail lines east-west to avoid the north-south pole and to actually see a Canada that can have a continental grid and see a Canada that is able to avoid what Ralph Nader talked about in Toronto Star today as deep integration, right? So circumstances, I'm saying, are the only thing that's really going to do it. And when they do, to what extent do you think Canadians can rise up to that challenge and be a Canada? I've heard that phrase, rise up. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, th this is a response, Jeff, without accepting a single one of your premises in the strength with which they were expressed. Okay. Um, I, I, I think um, there's some truth in everything you say, but um, I think it's grossly overstated. I think the problem, the problem is as much we don't know what to do as as that government is advocating its its problems. I mean the advocating its responsibilities. And, and the, the um, nationalization of General Motors in the US and in Canada was the case in the point. It was not that the government did not have the will to take over. It did have the will to take over. It was that it didn't know what to do when it had taken over. And it, and it, and it got the wrong ideas. It's not that the government doesn't intervene in the economy but it intervenes in the economy in dysfunctional ways and, and the, the, the resource industries are, 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 are a case in point. But there is some truth to what you're saying. Um, I think the, what's happening in Quebec, to come to the, your particular question, which doesn't depend on, on your premise at all, um, what, what's happening in Quebec um, is it, fascinating because they're, they're, they're it, it is possible, and not entirely unreasonably, to see um, uh, the um, appeal of Jack as an, uh, as an appeal of federalism of a sort, asymmetrical federalism, <coughs> as they, they call it, um, uh, a, a reaching out to the rest of Canada, a, um, in, in Quebec's terms, and a dispensing of the uh, separateness of, uh, of, of Quebec politically, not, not separateness uh, culturally and, and um, in, in, those, in those related ways. And, and maybe we have a, a, a moment in Canadian history where it is possible to, to again to have national projects such as the ones that we're talking about, and there is no better topic on which to have those national projects than energy. I mean, Quebec could be potentially a very big beneficiary for the national group. How realistic is it for us to be working with the Americans on these problems? And how are they on, on what? On just on you know integrating the energy grid, strengthening the energy grid. I mean, we're going to have the natural resources. We're going to yeah. have the hydroelectricity. They're not. Well, so you know they're going to want some of that. You know, and the big, the biggest, the biggest some solar. In, in North America, the, the, the biggest electricity, electricity resources is concentrated solar power in, in the Southwest. Um, How do you get that to all the I know, uh, yeah.
But uh, we, we're okay in Canada with our hydroelectric, except that we, we use it all wrong. You know, I mean, we're 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 um, we we are the third highest hydroelectric share in the world. Uh, in Austria and um, Norway are the two. Of the of our power more, more, more. Yeah, you yeah. yeah. get that even higher. Even yeah. higher. yeah, yeah, <coughs> yeah. So, but yes, I mean, there should. I, I I'm all for um, integration there, but part of that integration uh, could include a a a a, a, Canada, a Canadian grid. It's both symbolic and, and um, good, and I think. Um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be so keen on this, but a, an oil pipeline could be an interesting. So, if, you know, if the politicians took that and ran with it as a platform to unify Canada, yeah, I mean, that would actually help them in the long run. Especially if we start facing and and, you, and, and and Jack is very open to these things. I mean, the the um, he, you know the the two things that he would focus on in terms of a national nation, and he, and he would he would work. In, in different ways with Quebec with the rest of the country as part of this asymmetrical thing, but, but already they have a different pension scheme. Our pensions and health, but, um, and, and health is already a way Canadians to find themselves, pensions could become a way, and, um, and, and we, we do have, I should say thanks to the, the Liberal government, we do have one of the most robust national pension schemes in the world. Um, uh, that was entirely uh, a very good friend of mine wrote the book on on, on this on, on the Canada Pension Plan and um, he, he, Bruce Little and he's worth, worth, worth listening to just in this respect what a hero Paul Martin was you know I mean just absolutely regarding this grid this, yeah. this West Canada grid um, in terms of from a constitutional standpoint in terms of federal and provincial rights and responsibilities and so on how significant are the political barriers to a trans to a cross country grid? You know, if somebody would take the initiative, I don't think they would be very large. Um, you, you don't. The, the, I mean, I mean, high, uh, natural resources are provincial responsibilities. And that's right. Canada, I mean, yeah, but cross cross border trade is federal responsibility. But can they, But you, but you think the you think the federal government could get the province to play ball? Have, yes. Yes. It would, every every single province. Uh, the, the, the only big problem is, is a weird one. It's between Quebec and, and Newfoundland. Okay. Well, that's just. That's I know. Just I know. Like I know. Longer, right? it's, but every other province would benefit from the national grid. Okay. And do they and, do they perceive they would they perceive it that way? Uh, Are you they, believe they, that? They, but would, no, would well, they would have. To, they, there are discussions in every province sure, okay. uh, about this. It is not high on anybody's priority, but I mean, as, as I said, the place I've actually worked on this is in the four western provinces, and each of them would BC less than the others, but each of them, because you know it's got a big barrier, uh, would welcome um, uh, a national grid. But there's a cost factor here. Uh, yes, there would have to be provincial agreements across boundaries. I mean. It is a provincial responsibility, but moving across provincial boundaries is a federal responsibility. So, you know, it's it's each one is a tripartite arrangement. I mean, we've seen in the past how well uh, how, how well the federal or provincial government get along in this kind of situation. So, I mean, it's just, you know, it's, you know, well, so just that's just yes, but it, 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 there, there is the part, again separating this one provincial squabble out of, of Quebec and Newfoundland. Um, it, it's almost a win-win situation for everybody. But it needs leadership. Sure. Mm -hmm. well, one, one more. Can I ask one more question? One more question. <laughs> uh, why? You, 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 um, Canada does not have a strategic petroleum reserve. Every other country, essentially every other country uh, in the world does. Um, why? Not every other country, but every other rich country. Every every other. Sure. Why? It, it, why are we different from all the other there, there Western only, nations? There are only. Um, two members of the International Energy Agency, which is um, uh, kind of sub part of the OECD Organization of Economic Property Development, which is the kind of club of rich economic countries, although there are several poorer ones in Mexico and Turkey and so on. Um, but 
There are only two oil, net oil exporters in that. Well, actually, there's three. Denmark is a slight exporter, but it's just an outcome to be again. It, it suddenly become one about three years ago, and it's going to still not be one. But um, it, it, in any kind of long-term basis, there are only two uh, net exporters, and they are Norway and um, Canada. And the rule of the International Energy Agency is that unless you are a net exporter, you have to have a strategic petroleum reserve. And is that why the rest of the world has strategic petroleum reserve? Because well, there's the, the rest of the world. It's the rest of the world. Right. And I, I know, I know. I'm yeah. sorry. I mean, yeah. But is yeah. that why the rest of the world? Yeah. Oh, our, yeah. yeah. Like, seriously, when you talk about us and them, us is the OECD. Right, okay. Them is anybody who is. Yeah, well, there's basically, so is that, so is that why know, the other there's basically three groups. There's, there's the International Energy Agency, there's OPEC, and there's the rest. Right. So, so that's the reason why the rest of the OECD members have the strategic growing reserves, because that's the rules. That's, that's the rules, yes. Not because they think it's a good idea, necessarily. They think it's a good idea. That's they also think it's a good idea. Yeah. The, the, the International Energy Agency was created as a result of the OPEC crisis. That's, that's right. right. So why doesn't Canada... That's your question. Yeah, okay. Well, the, the, the answer is that the Canada, Canada is not required to have one, and therefore it doesn't have one. The, and because it's a net, well, Canada is a very substantial net export of oil. And it costs them $22 billion to make their the U.S., right? Yeah. So it's, it is a, there is a price. Oh, uh, it yeah. gets by the oil. Yeah. Yeah. That's all right. <laughs> my question is a short one. The, uh, what's your reservation on the oil pipeline idea? Um, the reservation is that I haven't really looked into it in the way that I looked into parts of the electricity one, that um, I I don't know what the alternatives are. I haven't really examined the risk of the oil coming through the US where it comes through now. Um, and it's more ignorance than anything else. It's not that I'm against it. But the citizens do help. <laughs> citizens are armed. Yeah, sorry? Yeah. Their citizens are armed. If they, if they really want to keep the oil, they hold it. Oh, yeah. well, they, they, well the, you know, it's not the question they're keeping the oil, because then Alberta could, and Saskatchewan could stop the flow south. Yeah. And it's the same oil, you see, so it would get very messy. Right. So the, and it's the same oil companies for the most part. So you, 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 you get a really messy situation between East and West Canada. And maybe there's a good reason for doing it, even if it doesn't make sense just to avoid the possibility of Alberta ha having these and Mountain Street for the Mountain. Mm -hmm. It's not so yeah. something you've been waiting there. Yeah, so earlier today I was at the Monk School and we talked about governance and the major problem is the lack of political will. Conservatives don't give a shit about the environment. Our mayor is ill informed and um, apparently he's a Carlton dropout. So the, the corporate media is framing the number one issue is let's say economy, number two is healthcare, and some people are concerned about the environment, and then yet people are concerned with education. How would we apply this to the provincial vote, given that we're at a time now, and it's within the 40s, before we get results? How, how would we approach uh, addressing these topics that people are all picked out with healthcare, the provincial level, and so much of the question? You know, this, 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 this is very interesting because, I mean, again, a, a little bit countervailing Jeff's point. I mean, the Ontario government has been pretty aggressive in, in terms of its energy well, we issues. Well, we've been for 50,000 in three years. Yeah, so. but it, 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 in my view, it's been doing the wrong things. So it's not that it hasn't been trying to intervene, it hasn't been trying to do something. It's just... Yeah, but like, Canadian Tower would fuck with them by putting like the eco fee on the receipt and then everyone gets all pissed off because yeah. no one's educating on the yeah. fact that well to get rid of electronics not smart, right? They yeah. will try to make a lot of money for recyclers. And no one's paying me for my electronics. So I go take the recycler directly and I can keep it. Right? Six bucks is gonna kill you. No, what I'm saying is uh, if you look at the way you recycle, uh, you know, you put all of your recycling in big boxes that can be put on the corner and then the government pays that and it makes money off of that. So the fact that they're putting all these fees on us while the price of commodities is rising and they're selling that the same recycling to bigger recycling companies, making money off us and then taxing us on top of that. 
So it's 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 working against us. So are you sure they're actually making it? Yeah, I don't think they are. I don't know. Yeah, yeah I'll make them off paper, but yeah, not off paper. papers. Yeah, off the like them. Yeah, I don't think for the most PG? part, I think it's cute. It's all cheap. PG costs about eight, whatever, <coughs> seven hundred. But that's why they're pushing campaigns like you know, recycle your old electronics because they yeah. don't want the electronics because they want to make money. Which the only thing. Thing. But then again, we're also paying taxes. We're also paying taxes for for, for removal of trash and and and, and you know, recycling materials. There are, there are increases in our. But well, no, who is not paying as the producers? The producers, if there was extended producer responsibility, it would be not an issue. I mean, you have to. But then, how do you bring about extended producer responsibility? Well, some companies are working. You just you just make a lot. For example, Nike. You know, they make shoes that you really come apart and can be recycled because they're working with the whole cradle to cradle system. A very, what, there's a very patient couple of people over here while you're having great time. Um, I wanted to know what you think about, uh, you know, like Obama's good focus on subsidies of oil companies you know, and energy companies. Do you think that's a viable alternative to moving subsidies instead of having a carbon tax or instead of tax and trade? Yeah, I think, I, I think subsidies are crazy. I mean, um, the, the OECD has been railing against energy subsidies for for decades and it hasn't made a lot of ground because you know, it's a, it's a national issue so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, subsidies are crazy absolutely crazy well, so this is the first time i've seen this like in the american media yeah the first time the, the american media is actually doing their job and actually talking about it they're pushing the republicans on it they don't want to answer the question mm -hmm. when they say like, are you going to take subsidies out and they you know, as usual, they go to another topic. Yeah. But I'm really surprised that they're actually keep bringing it up because in my lifetime, I've never heard them ever talk about it. <laughs> and I don't know uh, what, what effect do you think that will have on the public at large once they... I don't know. I mean, subsidies to oil companies and exploration generally is a, <coughs> a little bit obscure, but it's nice that it, it's reaching conscious, consciousness. But, yeah, I mean, to come back, I know you, you had a point, to come back to, to another point, I mean, people really don't want to deal with the, the hard issues. I mean, this, this is, we, we talked quite a bit about automobiles before, and people just like automobiles, and indeed, they're very, you know, handy and nice, and, you know, they just, they're, they're, but, and so, Governments nod towards regulating them, and, but the, when you come down to it, there's only one way to reduce automobile use. There really is only one way. The rest of it is just thrill, and that is to have fewer automobiles. Because basically, in any country, more or less, no matter what you do, the same number of kilometers per automobile are driven. It does depend on the geography of the country somewhat and, and a few other things. But basically it's have a car, we'll use it and travel. And it, it's the, the way, if you look at government policies, and my, my Canadian friend John Adams, who lives in London, not John Adams, who is a councillor here, um, has a wonderful article on this. He analyzed government policies and he said that when you, when you look at government policies, and he was talking about Europe and particularly Britain, the, the, the vision that they come forward with is that everybody should have a, a car, and maybe two cars, but should always keep them in the, in the garage or in the driveway. <laughs> Which, of course, is an absurdity. If you have a car, you use it. I mean, I, I, I know a case of a, of a woman who was very happy uh, commuting uh, a little bit by bus and by subway, and and, and then her her mother, who lived out in Asian Court, got a bit um, um, you know homebound, and so she she felt she had to buy a car in order to uh, visit her mother because it was difficult to get there on the subway and so on. And then she used the car for shopping, and it was very convenient. And then she she you know I mean every intention of just using the car. For this, every other Sunday going out there, when it, she could have taken a cab, it was more cheap, cheaper. But um, she, now she drives to work downtown. Have a car, you'll use it, and you'll creep towards the 18,000 kilometers uh, 
a year the cars in Canada are driven. That was 12,000 a year average. Miles. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's, it's my opinion that transitioning away from all this cheap energy is going to create so many jobs that we'll have labor shortages. And we have to, because we need to have combined heat and power plants that are going to be building like this while we have natural gas. We need to build heat pumps, drill holes in people's homes. Millions of this. But we have to be able to sell the existing industry on this project and, and show all the union members, the, uh, the people who own the industry, that they are still needed. We're not going to do away with all this stuff and make some magical utopia that's powered by hydroelectric power. Because we're going to it's more than just that. All the homes need to be renovated. Let's say, uh, Penman, uh, a lot of the NGOs have been doing really, really good studies, quite extensive studies. And the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives just put out a request for three more grad students to, to do the, more of the same. So, yeah, the, they are there. And in that sense, it's actually, that's probably the best thing to focus, to give a positive vision for, for, for it. I, I think this is absolutely true for the medium term. And it, but, but it's not true for the short term, and it's not true for the long term. But we can deal with the long term. And in the long term, um, a lower energy society will, will have less of employment, but that, that could potentially be a nice thing. Less, em less employment or less unemployment? Less employment. Oh, I'm thinking less that employment. we don't have to work so hard. Yeah. yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> People want to work really hard before oil or electricity. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, but I'm talking about a society where everything is used so efficiently that, um, you know, and it becomes automated. I mean, let me give you an example. One, one of the, if we are going to build a subway under uh, Eglinton Avenue, one of the things we should be doing is doing what they do now in Europe, almost invariably, which is automated. And the technology is there and it's perfect. Uh, you automate a subway, uh, it's cheaper uh, both to build and to operate, and it uses, has less labor and uses less energy, and, and everything is satisfactory. Except that you lose jobs. So you have to figure your way around that energy saving device. And I think there, I mean, I, this is a longer term thing. I think in the longer term, we will move to, we'll, we'll either collapse or we'll move to a much more efficient society where people are are, are um, behaving very differently. I think the medium term, which could be quite long, you're absolutely right. The problem is how to get there, how to get across the short term. And, and I think the biggest barrier in getting there, and this has been touched on before, is that we face economic collapse because we, we haven't got this oil business sort of yeah, because the only the only thing that we're doing to regulate the supply, the, the demand for oil at the moment is having recessions. Yeah. Uh, getting back to national things, I, uh, and I don't know the answer to this totally, but what about a national transit policy? I don't think any, we, we don't really have one. I'm not sure if it's any, probably the APS. But what would a, a sensible national transit policy well, uh, entail? And would that not be a bunch of subsidies as opposed to counter the subsidies? Yeah. Um, a sensible national transit policy would, would um, involve electrifying all the buses. <laughs> okay. And um, where you put something else in, you would be requiring uh, that as far as possible, it be built without subsidy. And operated without subsidy. Built and you, smart, in other words, you, and you would try and create the conditions that it's that it's built without subsidy. And, you know, th th this is not rocket science. I, mean, I, did, I did an article on this in the Star in 2006, building subways without subsidy, and showed how the Spadina line could be built without subsidy by um, simply having sufficient density at each of the stations. There, that, that, and the supply line is now being built, and there are not zero plans, but there are almost no plans to put in that density. And where there are plans to put in density, it's not related to the, to the subway. The, the, the Bourne Metropolitan Center, if you go on the Bourne website, um, 
which is at the end of this subway line, doesn't even mention the subway line. It says, we have expressway connections to the airport and the downtown. I mean, this, this, is, this is not going to build subways without subsidy. Uh, but they, it, can, it can be done. What about getting away from public, purely public transit and working on a partnership between private public transit? Creating, uh, you know, before, before we had the DTC, we had a lot of private, you know, private you know, trolley services around town. What if we could go back to that and start developing the profitable routes that we already know are there? You know, we give them contracts out, you know, we regulate. Do uh, you think that's a good idea? Well, I'm a great fan of how things are done in Sweden. And in Sweden, in 1985, they privatized all their transit, every single day. And this is the most left-wing um, rich country. And it has worked with some hiccups. It has worked superbly well. Um, what, what happens is that um, take, take uh, Stockholm is a little bit more complicated, but take a place like Göteborg, which is the second largest city in Sweden. Uh, they divide, it's about half a million people, they divide the routes up into baskets, franchises, and every five years people bid to run a package of routes. And they're selected by good ones and bad ones. Uh, and good to manage together and so on. And what happens is uh, they go up every five years and the workers don't change because they've got job protection. The management changes and the investors change, which is probably what we need here. Um, change the management, change the investment. The, um, the result has been superb. Uh, the um, public cost of transit has gone down, the service has gone up, the customer appreciation has gone up, the work satisfaction has gone up. All the measures that by which you might... Uh, so worker salaries have stayed pretty much the same, uh, yep. gone up, yet their satisfaction is... Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Who Who makes a now, can, 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 I just, can I just say, when, when I broached this to my friends in Canada, they said, well, it couldn't work here. Because the secret is that it, the counties, and it's the county governments that basically run this in Sweden, like the equivalent of regional governments, they run this in a very, very tight way. So what happens is that they, they issue a request for proposals every five years, and it sets out the standards that have to be met precisely by these companies. And what they bid for is the lowest subsidy they need to meet the standards. That's what they're bidding for, okay? And the one that bids for the lowest subsidy gets the contract, providing they meet, you know, uh, other conditions of submission of capital. So there's the efficiency that it wouldn't be visible here or wouldn't, wouldn't work? Well, but, but, the, but the, the county then imposes those standards and huge fines, risk and loss of contracts, you know, a bus is late, lose your contract, whatever. You know, I mean, I'm exaggerating a bit, but the, the standards are very tight. Standards of cleanliness, obviously of safety, and, and, and so on. But it's level of service, take it up. Yeah, yeah, level of service. Everything is monitored. Uh, they have to monitor itself, but the monitoring is monitored, you know, and, and so on. I mean, the, the degree, how it's done and how it's managed is almost... The, the, the transit management in Toronto would not understand how things are happening there. They, they simply wouldn't understand it. Well, it's a different culture, too. It's yeah, it's a different culture. But people say that it couldn't happen here because you wouldn't have a government that would be tough enough to to uh, apply it, the, the rules. And that, we that's saw, the case. We saw it in Britain, right, under Thatcher, a privatization of rail service. Right? They took a public rail service to yeah. privatize it. And what happened? And this has happened in countless examples throughout countries that aren't the most leftly, yeah. you know, rich countries in the world. Is we've seen in the Anglosphere, what we've seen is privatization of public utilities, privatization of public services, and invariably the uh, the, the companies that take over take the most profitable parts of the system, and then are allowed to leave the unprofitable. And so, as a result, the government, because of political pressure, is forced to run the unprofitable parts, which are no longer being subsidized, 
by the profit requirements. So they end up with a one-time infusion of cash and actually a larger debt at the end of the day than they had when they started the whole thing. Well, what, what, what you say is true, but there's a huge exception in Britain which, which, which shows that the, 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 the one word that you said is wrong is invariably. Because in Britain there is a huge exception, but for most of Britain what you say is absolutely true. And that is the bus service in London, where, um, I mean, what Thatcher did, uh, I mean, she was extreme. She, she didn't want to go for this franchising business. She just said, we'll have competition on the road, not competition for the road, where, which is the franchising, but on the road. She, she said, anybody can run a bus anywhere they want. All they have to do is to give 42 days notice to, to an authority as to the, the change, you know, what, what they are doing. But that, that's all, no other, apart from safety and so on. But even she felt that this was too risky some, uh, business to um, impose on London. And what they did in London on the buses, not on the, the subway, the underground, they did the Swedish system, exactly as I have just described. And it works like a dream in London. Partly because um, they had a tough government, in, in London, the, the, the city government, saw it. The city government. City government, yeah. Or the agency of the city government that oversaw it. And, and, and partly because it just needed to be done. I mean, the, the, the place wouldn't function without it. So, what you say does apply to the rest of Britain. In, and and the, the fascinating thing is that bus patronage has gone up consistently in London and down consistently. In, in the rest of the country. So I, think, sure. I think the problem, you know, with, with having a purely public system is, say you start running into people problems where people get out of their cars, get on that system, there's going to there's going to be capacity issues, right? So with a private system, well, there's more customers. I'm going to bring in another bus and service, you know, new customers. But then how do you stop the crew? Or well, you know, you, you you regulate heavily, like uh, you just just like you do in Sweden, you 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 bundle up the routes and and, and so on. I, the, the real problem is that it's quite important in, in government to separate the regulation of something from the operation of it, okay? And we, on transit, we haven't figured out how to do that in Canada. And you could do it with the whole thing being in the public sector, but we, we, we just haven't done it. Two separate but, agencies? Yeah, yeah. What about Japan? In Tokyo, they earn a lot less, the transit workers, but it works incredibly well. Are they mostly private? private. Mostly yeah. private. No, not entirely. How do they manage to actually get the vehicles? Who buys the vehicles and the hardware? Uh, in Japan? Japan? Well, in Japan, in Sweden, in London, is it a private provision of the buses, and et cetera, or is it, or is it a public purchase? Because um, that's, in a, I think, an important set of in, in, all of, in, in all of these cases, we're talking about private, private purchases. Okay. And part of the complication is the lifetime of, you know, extending beyond the... So that's all taken into account in the, in the... And it's all part of the negotiation. And sometimes in Sweden, in... in um, uh, you know, some challenging cases. There is provision in the legislation for the county to, for, to own the buses and so on, but it's not the normal thing. You know, the, 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 the normal thing is for the private company, private company and then, then they will buy them or they'll buy the leases or they'll buy, you know, whatever, or they'll take their buses and go somewhere else and somebody else will come in. I mean, in Gothenburg, there's quite a lot of streetcars, so the, the streetcars. I think continue to be owned by the city, um, and, and I just can't remember exactly how, how, how that works. But they're the same streetcars; they, they they're pre-1980, right? What, what about a ferry system? I mean, look, you know, I, I look back at the history. Of fair, ferry, both both. I mean, I mean, it wouldn't run all year here, but you know, you get five, six months ferries. You know, say they come to downtown Toronto, they go all the way over to Hamilton. They stop in Nice Saga, they stop in Burlington, or Philadelphia. They had one to, to um, Rochester, yeah. But that was a name for cars, though. I mean, I'm talking about commuter ferries, you know. Well, they're, they're, they, they, they use them in London, but only tens, and they're, they're moderately successful. Um, I don't know the particular economics of them, but in terms of ridership and use and, and patronage and appreciation, right, they're, they're, they're there. They, they, 
mainly go along the north, I mean, go from one place on the north bank of the Thames to, to another bank. Of the just because we're getting close to the yeah. red I was just wondering, um, we've seen an electoral cycle where you know, these kinds of issues are, are essentially existing. And we like, you know, we're going to have another electoral cycle, another one after that, as far as the guy can see. Where do you think the openings lie for activists, for you know the you know, folks around the Toronto or the Canadian Center? I think you should. I think whatever happens, you you should um, invite Jack during the next year to come to one of these sessions and give him give him the works. Okay. Um, that's what this group could do. I mean, it would be more people come in tonight. And, um, but, you know, talk about the NEP's energy policy within the context of a post carbon society and, and all, I mean, and, and have a real dialogue. This would be council chambers. <laughs> yeah. Yes. In my fair court. <laughs> well, I, I, I think it's entirely feasible that. that you, you could um, do it and you'd have a stunning evening. I mean, it, it may take several months to schedule it. So that, that would be my advice. Anything else to conclude? My, my question then, if nobody else got it. Um, it seems to me, by you know, my reading of the data, that Canada is fairly unique, not only from the point of view of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, where we are entirely alone on that particular issue. But we seem to be alone on another issue, which is in terms of the recouping of economic rent from the tar sand and the degree to which we're allowing ourselves to suffer from Dutch economic disease. You know, Serge Coulomb is a professor of political economy at the University of Ottawa and has done analysis of a couple of his European economist friends of the degree to which the job loss which we could pay from 2000 for 2008 in Canada, the manufacturing sector was 342,000 jobs. So then they undertook an analysis to say how much of that is as a result of Dutch economic disease here in Canada as a result of our dollar being linked to the price rise in the country. Right? So their analysis indicates a 53%. So in effect, we are actually losing more jobs from the tar sands than we are gaining from the tar sands. And at the same time, because in 1996, in Alberta, they had a manifesto that was written in concert with the energy companies called the Declaration for Opportunity. And they crow publicly about the fact that where else in the world can you get oil for once, you know, one cent on the dollar? We're giving it away, they said. They said for public attribution, they said this. They, with pride, they said this. So there's no place in the world that seems to get less economic rent or to suffer the ravages from you know Dutch economic disease. And again, you know, I haven't seen Jack Layton take this on or Elizabeth May take this on or Michael Natya take this on, right? So out of that, you know, parcel of that. I, I'm hundred percent with you on, on the on the red business. Um, it, it, it's a travesty. Um, I, I, I I don't know the Cologne analysis. Um, I think the there's certainly a strong argument to be made for what happened in, in the Netherlands. Um, I think in North America it's more complicated, and I think the job losses in North America, the de the deindustrialization in North America has uh, a much broader base. I mean, there's no doubt. Well, there's that there's think, talking about a very specific period from 04 to 08. Yeah. Well, what, what I'm saying is that. I, I think the, the deindustrialization of North America is a more complex business than, than to attribute it just to um, uh, the links between the dollar and the oil and the lack of return from oil sands and so on. Although I would agree that was a factor. I think in the Netherlands it was a clearer case that the the, the, the natural gas screwed up their economy. I, I think our economy has multiple sources of screw up, of which one of them is the one you mentioned. <laughs> That's all I would say. Anybody else? <laughs> on anything at all? I, when, I, when I say it, I'm talking about the, the industrial part of our economy. 
Yeah. Uh, uh, battery swapping for certain types of transportation which have regular stops like, are not available to any of us. Is that viable? Oh yeah, and, and Nissan and um, and Renault and uh, the um, I forget the name of the, the, the company in California that's putting this together. Mm -hmm. No, no. Um, the Israeli. Well, their 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 product is it's actually a California company, but they're busiest in Israel. Yeah, uh, I forget the name of it. Better place or something. Oh yeah, that's it. Is it, what's it called? I think it was better. It was better. better. Yeah, something, something like that. Um, they, they're working, working on this, and, and I think it's, um, I mean, it's a kind of Heath Robinson-ish thing. It's like taking out your gas tank and putting in a new gas tank. You know, in, in, but um, the, I mean, part of the problem I have with batteries and, and swapping them doesn't solve this is that. It's a huge, expensive, big part of the vehicle that you're carrying around all the time. And of course, the bolt makes it worse because it's also carrying around an internal combustion engine, which you hardly use it. Okay, maybe the go buses. The go buses, they're, they go from town to town, and if there's not a roof or ability to put electric wires in some yeah. way. I think the electric wire thing is much more elegant rather than. I mean, batteries are really. You have a you have a gas tank or a diesel tank, and 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 you you have the best battery we've ever heard about, and there's less than a hundredth of the energy in in that battery, usable energy. It's saved by the fact that electric motors are about four times as efficient. So, but it, it's still a hundred times or more than a hundred times the amount of energy. What about the weather? Um, like on the CBC, a couple of times they noted they made they made noises about the uh, electrical um, faults going into the sidewalk over this winter. How are they fully successful in getting around the weather? Like if they do run electric trolleys, you can land back for them. Are they really that dependable with the weather? Like is it? Because I, I was just thinking. You said, oh, in France they run the, they could run the power from underground. Well, maybe in France or in London, it's not frozen all the time. But here, you have all this like frozen water going down below ground, and with salt, you know, salty frozen water. I mean, it perfect you know, conductivity. Um, or also with the whatever going up. Is it, is it that easy to make it resistant, weather resistant? These systems. Trolley buses. Like, trolley buses. Yeah. You, yeah. Well, you. you I mean, you, it's a bit of a digression to talk about it going underground because you know, most stuff in Canada doesn't go underground. Really. It's yeah. kind of very rare. Um, the the grounding issue just seems. To, I mean, this is this is really weird. The the dogs getting shot and electric too. I mean, this doesn't really happen a lot in other places, including Russia. You know. So this is just like. Major infrastructure. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what what it is that, that uh, brings that Negative. problem. Yeah. But the, the the question of the reliability of electric vehicles that are grid connected is is simply a matter of design. I mean, I mentioned the Vancouver trolley buses that were coming off. I mean, their weather was okay, but they were coming off their wires all the time, and and now they don't. And you you. It's, it's a matter of design, and, and there's not a cold weather issue. Yeah, there's an occasional issue, you know, with either freezing rain and stuff like that. You give the engineers too much credit, Richard. Yeah. What I'm saying is that if you go to a place like Bodeburg, where I spent some time, and it has a harsher climate than Toronto. Um, really? And that's the question, right? I mean, how... Um, uh, in the winter. More snow? I can't give you the See, and that's the thing. Yeah, right? There's still cyclists on the street. And that's what I, I you know, yeah. I question but in, that. In, Swe in Sweden, um, they, they seem to, they don't seem to have problems with the, with the uh, overhead connections. But now, there, there is another issue, which is what I thought you were getting into, which is batteries. Batteries do not work very well in cold weather. Yeah. And, and um, 
you know, one of the things that Manitoba has just announced this week is that they can be battery paradise because um, even though batteries don't work very well in cold weather, everybody has a plug-in heater. <laughs> okay. Anyway, we're going to put it because the the oil engine oil is solidified, and so the same plug-in outlet will be used to keep the battery warm. And their electric vehicle testing so that they won't have this cold weather battery problem. And once once the batteries start getting in use in an electric vehicle, they actually warm up a bit. So they don't, they don't have that problem. But they, they do have a severe cold weather problem. Which is what I thought you were going to say. How are we for, for metals in terms of the lithium and uh, nickel for the batteries? I mean, I've heard things from, you know, we can only build 5 million cars in yeah. America, up to 100 million. Right? Yeah. A little bit. Lithium is a completely recyclable uh, thing. We have one place in Canada, it's in BC, that can recycle lithium. Um, it, it's, um, uh, a very, it's a very widespread substance, but the, uh, not too much in the way of concentrated uh, sources. Um, which I think are mainly in Bolivia, right? I can't remember where they are. Bolivia is going to be the new place. But, it, but it's Canada's got some. Yeah, the Canadian Lithium Corporation has um, um, quite a, um, uh, a lot of opportunities there. It, the, the simple answer to the question is that um, there are issues, but there are not big issues with, with lithium supply. There have been suggestions that there are big issues and they, they, they've been demonstrated. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, matter, it's a matter of cost and, and, and availability. There are, there are places where it's cheap to get out and places where it's not. Well, I'm just thinking, you know, if, if we could somehow scale up our, you know, renewable electric infrastructure and then we could somehow find enough batteries to put, a, you know, big lithium ion batteries in every single vehicle in North America, would that be you know, feasible in terms of material well, I don't think it would be the way to go. I don't know ab about the exact thing. I mean, even lithium batteries are quite heavy and bulky, and and you use energy to charge them, and you use them to discharge them, and they're very costly. And there's not, I mean, they're, they're going to come down by 50% or, 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 or maybe two thirds. But I mean, why pin your hopes on a system that is carrying this huge weight, expensive weight around? I mean, we, we have and to just use the electricity directly. Use the electricity directly, and what I what I think we're going to have to do is move towards a uh, and and I can't remember if when I talked to this group back in November, I mentioned personal rapid transit. I I did, and I think that's the way we're going to have to go. And I avoided mentioning it tonight, but that's another national mission here to move on personal rapid transit, which I may or may not be getting from the back government. Well, let's thank Richard Gilbert for a very entertaining <laughs> Dear? Excellent idea. I'll buy you a Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry.